Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, coming to uh, to watch our uh, our presentation. We're going to talk to you today about a beautiful story um, about how we managed to uh, to run our bank while working from home in in a year where where we faced uh, the the biggest pandemic in in hundred years. Um, it's going to be a mix of stories. It's going to be a mix of learnings and things that we've tried to uh, to uh, and, and ways to which we try to adapt during the the pandemic. Um, and also, you might have the feeling that you know some of these things. Well, you know, after one, one year after this, or six six months after this this started to cool down. Of course, it's easy to to say that you know what you had to do. We just want to tell you the the story uh, and the approach that we had. So. Um, Today, alongside with my friend George, we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, about this. Let's start with with a short introduction about who we are. So my name is Mihai Popa. I'm uh, the head of uh, a department which basically creates software in order to uh, to help us with the with the monitoring and the operations part of uh, for for ING. Um, the software is written in Java, and and the customers are always the most difficult customers that we can have. Our four thousand Soft Java software engineers of ING. And George, what about yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is George, and I'm the IT Ops chapter lead within the cybersecurity and fraud area. And we are managing mostly assets related to authentication, signature, and fraud pipelines. Thank you very much for the short introduction. Um, let's move forward now. So, um, apart, apart from from our uh, our um, uh, names and then the, the the job that we're doing it's i think it's important for you to know where are we coming from as well we're coming from romania romania it's a country in uh, southeastern europe um known for dracula dracula's castle but also for uh, for good it engineers um and for uh, for the ones who are from europe probably you also know it from uh, from one of the, the the most beautiful roads in europe according to uh, to top gears uh, bbc um, let's talk about uh, our company. Our company is called ING. It's a Dutch bank headquartered in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, and ING is a, is, is a medium-sized bank which is heavily focused on uh, technology. Or um, this is at least what our uh, former CEO has um, said a couple of years back. He said, we want to be a tech company with a banking license. So ING aims to hire the best uh, technology talents and and aims to uh, uh, develop the, the best software that uh, that that it can uh, in inside the company. We are uh, the, the bank is is split in in four big areas. Uh, we're talking about market leaders, who is the Benelux area, so that's the core market of of the business of ING. Then we have the growth, the growth and the challengers. So for challengers, th these are uh, regions or areas where ING is trying to catch up and and you know take take the lead. And the growth markets uh, are the, the areas where we actually have a huge potential to grow uh, comparing to, to the, the spot where we are today. Of course, we cannot neglect the, the wholesale banking area. So we have presence in multiple countries like um, uh, China, United States or, or South America with our wholesale bank. Well, moving ahead, uh, we told you about what, uh, what we do, who we are, uh, what ING does. Um, but let's talk about the core of this subject. And I'm, I'm going to let George tell a couple of words about this picture uh, with with the sun and, and and winter. So how this this started, George, like uh, one year and a half ago? Indeed, um, let's dive into today's topic. So for me, it was quite interesting because uh, it actually started in Asia. I was uh, there when the pandemic hit the news and it escalated uh, rapidly. Uh, this photo was taken on 1st of February in Japan. And in Asia, everything was taken seriously uh, from the beginning, even in the countries where there were only a few cases, like Japan. And I, I remember that uh, the face masks, for example, went out of, out of stock from one day to another. It was almost impossible to find one. Um, and from there, I came directly to a busy trip in, uh, in Romania. Um, but when I arrived in Europe, I was a bit shocked uh, coming from Asia, where all this like strict testing was in place. Uh, masks were already mandatory in some places and there were uh, extra cautions implemented. From there, I arrived in a place where people were looking uh, strange at me for wearing a mask on the street. Um, so yeah, this was my first my first impact. And uh, even if everything was okay, I decided, of course, to wear a mask 
as a precaution to protect everyone uh, because there were not so many things known about Corona at that point. So I wanted to, of course, put some extra safety measures in place. And um, this is me in the office on 11th of February. But I'll let Mihai now tell you how everything started uh, from a managerial point of view since he was uh, in Europe at that point. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, indeed, I think uh, what George just said, in Europe we were taking things a bit not too seriously at that uh, moment in time. I still remember 9th of March, uh, which is slightly later than, than 11th of February that George was mentioning. Uh, I was uh, waving to one of my colleagues here, uh, here in the office and uh, I was telling him, look, uh, I hope I'm going to see you on Monday. And he said, uh, likewise. Well, actually, um, we never returned to the office from that moment. Uh, onwards, um, and um, that was the moment when uh, when we started uh, experiencing this working from home and, and Corona time. So we, we started working remotely. Everybody was sent home. Um, of course, we did have some I obvious IT challenges. We um, with the internet connection, I, I did have issues with my my ISP uh, or uh, with the VPN. We we were used to work from home like two three days a week before, or one two days a week, depending on the country. But um, of course, the VPN was not designed to su support so many, uh, so many connections, simultaneous connections. Um, we had to adapt our way of working. We had more meetings, more calls, and more emails, um, and that actually uh, filled 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 in our agendas. Uh, we felt, in many occasions, that um, we actually needed a little bit more time to get used to this, and, and this is what actually happened. Um, the last thing, and, and I did like that George put it here on, on, the, on the slide, he said HWOW, uh, so home way of working. Of course, we had to adapt and everybody had to adapt the home way of working. Um, apart from that, the first three months were also about, you know, giving accountability and trust. So you send all the, we, we sent all the people at home, everybody was at home, but we had to, um, to give the accountability and the trust to the people because Obviously, this was um, was something you, you couldn't control the, the the work that they were doing so so closely as you would have done it in the, in the office. Um, and from a managerial point of view, I think this was a big step, and it was it was an exam for both the managers, the company, and the individual contributors. Now, of course, we did observe two behaviors, so we gave them accountability and trust, but we did see two things. Some of the people, like myself and George were um, more productive because it was more quiet at home and we're working longer hours and we were actually delivering more stuff but we started slowly to get tired so after a couple i think after one month and a half or something like that i was in the need of a holiday as i think you all know we're waking up brushing our teeth taking a shower and then going to to to, to work uh, and then we were getting up maybe at seven in the evening and then uh, we were sitting on the couch for the rest of the evening. So that was not really productive. And then we had the other people which were saying, ah, cool, my boss can't see me. So I'm going to be very relaxed and I'm going to, you know, touch the work as much as I can. Um, but yeah, how, how long can, can these habits last? They didn't last, actually last too much because actually what we tried to do were like, okay, we have enough work to do. There is too much. We have to do something about it. So we, th we thought about, as, as management, it would be good to reach out to our individual contributors by, by, by leading by examples, by giving them some examples. So um, we said, we are going to start exercising more. We are going to gonna buy some adequate equipment uh, for our desk because oh, Honestly, I didn't have a proper chair like I have in the office or a proper desk. Yeah, I do have a desk, but it's not so good as the one that I have in, in the office. Um, and then we encourage also our, our uh, individual contributors and our colleagues to do the same. And um, now this is, this is only the, let's say this is only the part where we try to lead by example. So we, we set the example with, with doing sport. And we said the example with, where we said, look, maybe we have to, to, to buy some chairs. But we also did some other stuff. For example, we said, look, why don't we have virtual coffee corners? Because in, in our uh, discussions with, the, with our engineers, one of the, the things that they mentioned were like, hey, I'm missing that coffee corner discussion. I'm missing to know what is happening in the organization, who's leaving, who's joining, what is, what, what is changing. Um, there were, we started also organizing events. It was a, a little bit, you know, weird at the beginning, 
but we did start having having the normal events that we were having in the past, like celebrations or stuff like that, virtually. Um, we started doing also virtual virtual games. We pushed a lot for that just to facilitate the social interaction, because we were feeling that people are are like robots. You know, they're they were waking up, starting working, and that that's it. Um, but how about ING? How did ING support us? Well, I mentioned earlier that we led by example say, by saying that we've actually um, bought some chairs and then some desks. Well, I, one of the things that ING helped us with was exactly this. They facilitated this. In some of the countries, they they you know they offered a budget. In other countries, they they really offered these these um, items at, the, at a very uh, discounted price. Also, ING gave the possibility to to have a, like a rotation system so when the situ the health situation uh in the pandemic situation sorry improved they said look we know that some of you actually really want to work from from the office so we're going to offer this possibility on a longer term they said uh look we're going to adapt the policy and we are going to encourage you to work from home even even more than this um and last but not least even even today, so we are still not over with this pandemic. ING says, look, we can think about longer term. So in longer term, yes, you can work 60, 70% uh, from home from your work time. But even today, you can you can like 50% of your work time can work from another EU country because ING is a is a company which has many, many foreigners. Um, apart from that, apart leading from example, and then looking at what ING did, uh, me and George will also try to have more interactions with with our engineers so when i'm saying interactions is not actually about the one-to-ones we did regular check-ins to ask them how they do how are their families we did uh, we did ask them to use um to turn on the camera like we we have it now in, in this recording right to have the camera turned on because that facilitate facilitates the the interaction between people and also to look at the camera when they speak uh to each other um We've also started to meet outside with, 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 with the people from our teams or from other teams when the situation allowed, just to facilitate a little bit the social interaction. Because many, many people were saying, yeah, we're feeling like robots and we should talk also about some other stuff than what we talk in our one-to-ones. Um, the last two were about, we made sure that we uh, feedback the company with the tools that are required from our people so that they can work. So we have adequate VPN speed or make sure that some of the tools are available without VPN. And of course, last but not least, we trusted the people to the max. We gave them absolute full confidence to do their work. And now if it would be to, to move forward, we're gonna, we wanted to talk to you about a very interesting topic. So we told you just a story about how we try to go through this pandemic and how we try to uh, uh, to navigate through it. But George is going to walk you now through some very interesting topics in the cybersecurity area, because cybersecurity was also a very important topic in 2020. George? Thank you, Mihai. So uh, what changed in 2020 in the banking sector in terms of cybersecurity? We uh, really wanted to highlight a few things because we don't have uh, much time. Um, well, there are first a few things. First of all, um, everyone was suddenly at home. And of course, uh, we had a spike in terms of uh, mobile and web usage for our applications. And this unfortunately also attracted the scammers and they started targeting these channels and basically fueled by a wealth of readily available online data combined with everyone working remotely, it became, let's say, easier for criminals to carry out uh, attacks and to target a large uh, chunk of people. Um, and there is a very interesting report that is uh, published by Europol every year. Uh, the last one is from October 2020. It's called the Internet Organized Crime Threat Assessment uh, that basically sums up the top frauds in our area. And um, since, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're a bit limited by time, I will only talk about the top three scams and uh, focus on the first one since it's probably something that uh, most of you are not uh, are not aware of. And uh, this is uh, the SIM swapping. Basically, be this uh, became the, the first scam trend uh, trend in Europe. And what is it? Uh, basically, this, this uh, SIM swapping uh, occurs when a criminal takes, takes um, control over your uh, mobile SIM card. So your, let's say, main phone number. 
And um, usually the criminals target a vi victim, so it's quite a targeted attack. Uh, they initially start by gathering personal data uh, through different, let's say, information that you may publicly uh, post on your social media, uh, some attempts of phishing, uh, maybe some even malicious software that they try to inject, uh, fake websites and so on. After they gather uh, the, the required information, uh, the fraudsters will try to basically convince the mobile phone operator uh, to either port uh, the phone number, your phone number, to a SIM card that they own, uh, or to order a new SIM card and try to intercept uh, the package uh, via the mail, mailing system, um, or even in some cases try to get a new SIM card directly from the shop. Uh, and of course, this kind of uh, differs from country to country because there are different uh, ways in which the operators are working. But these are kind of the main ways uh, they are uh, they will uh, get in the possession of your your SIM card. And uh, basically, one, once activated, this uh, new SIM card gives the fraudsters access to your calls, text messages, configure the apps that are that are requiring a phone validation, so that they can uh, basically reset your email accounts. Um, like and also access, for example, the online banking and other app critical applications that you may use. And sometimes this is also done via some automated scripts. So you actually don't have much time from the moment they uh, you lose connection till the moment they actually transfer some money from your bank account. And this is basically the fourth step. Well, uh, where at the point you're going to notice that your mobile phone lost connectivity, so you don't have network anymore. But usually, in, in these cases, you either think that may be, you're maybe in a, in a zone without signal or your phone has some issues and so on. So um, in many cases, it's only like a matter of minutes until the fraudsters will uh, try to change uh, the password of your, of your email account and then start digging what, uh, what accounts you have, what other critical, uh, critical applications you're using and how they can maybe even like start transferring some money. And yeah, this sounds a bit, uh, yeah, quite impossible to stop. I mean, how can you actually uh, prevent something like this? Well, th there are a few, let's say, steps that you can uh, you can take in order to protect yourself. Um, first one would be like, if possible, uh, you should keep your um, key accounts on different phone numbers. Like, for example, you can keep your uh, main email account on one mobile number, and then your banking accounts or or other critical applications that you may use on the other one. So like that, you kind of have a split. So if something happens with one of them, then you will still have access to the other one. So it will not be able, to, the processors will not be able to take full control of your life. Um, then have just have a plan in the unfortunate case you uh, see this happening. If you're, for example, in a very crowded area and you suddenly lose the network connection, you restart your phone and it's the same, then there is a high chance that you might be targeted by this. And what we do here, um, you, you can do a few things, like um, you can either have some um, generated MFA codes with some of your, of your friends that can, uh, let's say, quickly change the phone number of your main email account, uh, or have another phone number with some, um, uh, let's say, uh, phone, uh, yeah, the, with, the phone, with the contact details and the phone numbers of your bank so that you can call directly and um basically they can uh cut the access to your to, to your accounts and so on so kind of have like a plan in place on what uh, what you can do uh then the third thing would be um basically a mix of multi-factor authentication mix of mfas um in some cases some platforms are uh, accepting even like triple authentication so like that you can have your password an sms code or an authentication code uh combined also with a special token for example or yeah, different types of uh, authentication means. Um, and some of the platforms are also asking for a double uh, verification in case of a change of a password. So you basically need two of the things you have. You need the phone number plus another um, another of the MFAs in order to change the password. So this is also something that you can do and uh, we highly recommend it. Uh, then the last three are quite generic. Um, first of all, it's, it's, not, it's not okay to share public information on your on your, on, the, on your social media the things that uh, are personal and the fraudsters can use in order to uh, yeah build up your profile and get personal information about you then the second one would be that you should never click on the links in uh, suspicious emails uh, or sms's that you receive 
um, and if you do so, uh, never but never ever add any or insert any critical personal information there because in 99 of the cases it's uh, it's basically a scam. And last but not least, um, you should always change the PIN code, the default one of your SIM card, because in some cases you have the 1234 or 0000, 000, and these are the first uh, combinations that uh, someone that, for example, stole your phone number will try. And if, uh, if they succeed, then they can uh, basically do uh, the things that we discussed earlier uh, with using your, your main SIM, SIM phone, yeah, SIM card uh, until you manage to, to close it. Um, then coming back to the top three, uh, basically on the second place, it's uh, the business email compromise. And here there are um, two most common types uh, of DEC. Uh, the first one is the CEO fraud, uh, where basically the criminals will try to impersonate a C-level executive and will ask for an urgent, immediate bank transfer. Uh, and the second one is the invoice fraud where basically the criminals will try to send a fake invoice uh, or they will try to contact the company impersonating a supplier that changed the bank account and they basically they need an urgent payment for some, let's say, overdue invoices or they will like build a story uh, to make it uh, uh, urgent. And actually this, these attacks are uh, becoming more and more sophisticated and they uh, have a lot of research behind and they're very targeted. Uh, because basically the criminals uh, are recently using high-tech solutions um, such as uh, impersonating the voice of a C-level. So basically you receive a call and it will be the voice of your CEO saying that, uh, yes, uh, we have this urgent issue now, you need to transfer this, uh, I just sent you an email. They will spoof the email address and uh, they will tell you that, yeah, the email might be in spam because uh, it's very urgent and you have this IP issue and we really need to make this payment now. Uh, just check your email, uh, you have all the payment details there, make the transfer right now and uh, yeah, basically what are you going to do in that case? Because it's the voice of your CEO, uh, you know the voice, so uh, yeah, it, uh, they're, they're becoming, uh, let's say, more and more complex. So there are many, uh, many people from the financial accounting department uh, that are falling uh, into this. And um, yeah, basically the in the in the second case they will they will do more or less the same they will try to impersonate the the vendor that is sending the invoice or even intercepting the the invoices on the mail and uh, changing the bank account there or adding like a letter saying that yeah we changed the, the bank account please use the, the new account and so on so uh, yeah this is kind of the the second one and the third one is called the uh, bank smishing sms smishing is basically a yeah a combination of sms and phishing and it's uh in big lines and attempt by criminals to get their hands on your uh, personal information using SMS. And uh, basically here the, the SMS will contain a link uh, or they will instruct you to call a phone number in order to urgently update your account because there is a, there, there is a security breach or some other yeah, explanation to make it uh, sound very urgent. And basically this link, if it's on URL, it will lead for a, to a fake website and we come back to the same uh, um, the same recommendation that we had earlier, so never, ever, ever uh, insert uh, on you know dodgy link any personal information. Um, or in case of a phone call, they will try to yeah squeeze some personal information that can they can uh, they can later use. So um, I think this this was it from uh, that part. So now I will pass it to Mihai for the for the conclusion. Well, I think you should have said the the, the obvious, the, you know, the word of the year. You're on mute when I started talking. Um, so I think this was um, a very very interesting uh, walk through the most uh, important cybersecurity threats that have appeared in in 2020. Um, now, as a conclusion, as it's written on the slide, exceptional times require exceptional measures. So it's important to uh, support and connect with your colleagues. It's important to trust your employees. It's important to make them accountable. Um, it's also very important to create the right environment for this new normal. So um, you, you can trust and uh, make them accountable, but you also have to give them the, the, the space to, to be able to, um, to be successful in, in these difficult times. Um, the last one is all the yeah it, it, it's it's about staying staying a step ahead uh, of scammers um, and also uh, of course stay safe. We think 
and we hope that this uh, presentation has given you a different perspective or a new perspective um, about how to deal with these situations in the future, future, or maybe it has given you ideas how to deal uh, with, the, with the next months that are going to come. Uh, we, would, we hope also that you enjoyed it and uh, myself and George would like to thank you for, um, for the time uh, and we wish you to uh, stay safe and we are of course open for uh, connecting to you and for, um, for questions. And don't forget, be present during the conversations and look at the camera. Thank you very much. Hello, hello. We're actually um, open for questions, as we said. I don't see so many, so many questions there. Um, well, then, then um, I'll ask you. I'll ask you a question. I know it's still morning, and maybe people are. Um, are a bit shy. So, um, George, tell me a little bit. How is how is this going to move forward? So, we have we have been talking about the, the pandemic now. Post pandemic, how is your life going to change, or how did it change? We're a bit in a in a in a transition period. So, uh, what's what's next? Uh, indeed, I, I think at the beginning it was uh, it was a bit complicated for uh, for me because um, yeah, as as we all uh, started working from home, I think this this was like a general problem, and uh, at least what what I personally tried and uh, yeah, it was something that we also discussed with uh, with our teams. Uh, well, we we had to do this separation between uh, home and office because yeah, it suddenly became uh, yeah, the office became your home and uh, your home became your office. So uh, what? what I personally did, I uh, tried to implement a few things here. Um, because before I was just just working and then, yeah, at the point it was like, let's say 8 p.m. And yeah, I was still like, OK, I'll just finish this and then uh, I'll call it a day. Um, so I had to do this separation. And what I, what I did, I bought um, a standing desk. Um, and what I'm currently doing during the day, I'm uh, actually sitting. I'm, ju I'm just standing. So. Uh, the, the full day and at, at night if I still have to do some things at the, the PC then I will uh, I will just uh, sit on the chair uh, but like that I have like two let's say separate states when I'm in the office and when I'm I'm at home even though it's it's uh, it's the same room um, what else I did I uh, usually try to finish at a uh, yeah kind of set an hour where I where I, when I want to finish and in order to do this separation because before of course i was finishing at work then i was uh, driving home or walking home or uh uh yeah going away to to, to do sports and so on so i had this kind of like uh segregation between the two uh places the office and home and what i did i uh started uh, going out for a run so when i finish i just go out for a run or i go have uh, have dinner or go go to the gym now that uh, they are open um and yeah these were kind of the, the main things that i implemented and i also added a few things like um i started doing like a whiteboard where i write usually all my things that i need to do during the day um also personal but also yeah some things that are i um uh, i have to do in uh yeah at, at work so these were kind of the, the main things that uh, that i did so far uh, but now, yeah, uh, as you know, things uh, here are starting to to open up, at least uh, at least in Europe. So now, um, yeah, we can go back to the gym, go back doing some sports, uh, playing football, uh, swimming, and so on. So I think, uh, yeah, things are getting more and more uh, into the right direction since we, uh, yeah, many people are already vaccinated. Uh, for myself, I already had one dose out of two. So yeah. It's uh, starting to go into the, the, the right direction. Um, but how about you? If we still have a few minutes then. Yeah, about myself, I think it's not actually too different compared to what you said. Uh, pandemics are going to still be around. Uh, I think we're going to still deal with these situations. And I think we're going to also move to, to a new normal where we're probably we're going to do a hybrid mode between work from home and then working at home. So. Um, I'll, uh, the majority of the things that you've mentioned, I'm also doing. I don't have a standing desk, as you can see. I'm, I'm sitting now compared to you, 
um, but I think it's uh, your, your advice is uh, is good. And and as I said during the presentation as well, what we are sharing here it's not rocket science. We're just sharing some ins important insights and and reminders about what you guys can can do with with your teams. Um, and to to make also a joke. Um, you said you're you're having a whiteboard. Probably the the, the geek uh, the geeky people in, in in the call would say, "Hey, use Trello or, or any other uh, digital tool." So, uh... indeed, yeah, I actually kind of uh, use both. But um, yeah, I did this uh, let's say ceremony that I have every day uh, in the morning right. where I uh, just check the yeah uh, the previous day and I write it down for the tasks for for the day. So yeah, it's a uh, personal preference. Perfect, perfect. I hear you. All right, I think our uh, time is actually up. Thank you very much for uh, for listening to us. Um, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn and to ask further questions. And we wish you a, a great uh, rest of the day. Thank you, George, and uh, I wish you a good day as well. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.